compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. <coughs> if it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. And that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make any difference how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't make any difference how smart you are who made the guess or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. We mainly taught science at school as if it's made up of immutable facts, such as Einstein's theory of relativity or Newton's laws of motion. However, at the cutting edge of science, the truth is not always so obvious. We often have to deal with uncertainty in science. Complexity allows for confusion and for alternative theories to develop. The only solution is to look at all the evidence as a whole. And by testing and doing experiments, things get more and more certain. Knowledge becomes less and less tentative. But there are uncertainties that won't go away, especially in our ability to predict the future, where scientists can only talk in terms of probabilities. Does this uncertainty mean that the science is flawed? Gazimov was a great writer of fiction and non-fiction, science and science fiction. From a comment he made in one of his articles on the advancing knowledge of science, how much we know about the universe that the ancient humans did not. He received a letter from a non-scientist, an English lit major, who wanted to correct his attitude about science. I'll quote him. The young specialist in English lit, having quoted me, went on to lecture me severely on the fact that in every century, people have thought they understood the universe at last, and in every century they were proved to be wrong. It follows that the one thing we can say about our modern knowledge is that it is wrong. My answer to him was, John, when people thought the earth was flat, they were wrong. When people thought the earth was spherical, they were wrong. But if you think that thinking the earth is spherical is just as wrong as thinking the earth is flat, then your view is wronger than both of them put together. The basic trouble you see is that people think that right and wrong are absolute, that everything that isn't perfectly and completely right is totally and equally wrong. However, I don't think that's so. It seems to me that right and wrong are fuzzy concepts, and I will devote this essay to an explanation of why I think so." End quote. Once people believed the earth was flat, and they were wrong, but they were also very nearly right. The curvature of a flat surface is zero, and the curvature of the Earth's surface is very nearly zero, to a certain level of approximation, the kind of measurements the ancients were capable of. After some rather brilliant observation by great scientists such as Aristotle, the basic idea of a spherical Earth was advanced and measured a century later by the Greek philosopher Eratosthenes by noting the difference in shadow lengths at different latitudes. We thought then that the Earth was a sphere, and that the actual curvature of the Earth must be 000126 per mile, a quantity very close to, but not quite equal to zero. This difference was important in our ability to make accurate maps and sail great distances without missing our destination. So then we thought the Earth was a sphere, but that was also wrong. Based on observations of the other planets, Newton showed that rotating masses are very slightly flattened at the poles. Scientists measuring the Earth very precisely, using newer instruments, were able to determine the degree of obliqueness, the measure of departure from a true sphere. If the Earth were a true sphere, it would have a curvature of 8 inches to the mile, but the actual curvature varied from 7.973 inches to 8.027 inches to the mile. The correction in going from spherical to oblate spheroidal is much smaller than going from flat to spherical. Therefore, although the notion of the Earth as a sphere is wrong, strictly speaking, it is not as wrong as the notion that the Earth is flat. Even the oblate spheroidal notion of the Earth is wrong, strictly speaking. In 1958, when the satellite Vanguard 1 was put into orbit about the Earth, it was able to measure the local gravitational pull of the Earth, and therefore its shape, with unprecedented precision. It turned out that the equatorial bulge south of the equator was slightly bulgier than the bulge north of the equator. 
There seemed no other way of describing this than by saying the Earth was pear-shaped. And at once many people decided that the Earth was nothing like a sphere, but was shaped like a Bartlett pear dangling in space. Actually, the pear-like deviation from oblate spheroid perfect was a matter of yards rather than miles, and the adjustment of curvature was in the millionths of an inch per mile. In short, my English lit friend, living in a mental world of absolute rights and wrongs, may be imagining that because all theories are wrong, the Earth may be thought spherical now, but cubical next century, and a hollow icosahedron the next, and a donut shape the one after. What actually happens is that once scientists get hold of a good concept, they gradually refine and extend it with greater and greater subtlety as their instruments of measurement improve. Theories are not so much wrong as incomplete. Since the refinements in theory grow smaller and smaller, even quite ancient theories must have been sufficiently right to allow advances to be made, advances that were not wiped out by subsequent refinements. Naturally, the theories we now have might be considered wrong in the simplistic sense of my English lit correspondent, but in a much truer and subtler sense, they need only be considered incomplete. My friend has a theory that Elvis isn't really dead. He says that Elvis got tired of the limelight and faked his own death. He also has a theory that aliens regularly come to the Earth, but the government keeps their visits a secret. His weirdest theory is that all the leaders of the world are actually shape-shifting extraterrestrial reptiles pretending to be human. I have a hunch that my friend only says these things to make himself sound clever down the pub. You could say that I have a theory about my friend's theories. But really, I'm just guessing at what motivates him to say such outlandish things. My theory about my friend is just a theory. It could be wrong. Maybe he really does believe the things he says. In which case, there may be other explanations or theories to explain why my friend is such a fan of these conspiracy theories. As for me, I'm a fan of scientific theories, like the Big Bang Theory, the theory of evolution by natural selection, the germ theory of disease, plate tectonics theory, the theories of special and general relativity, and my favorite, quantum theory. Some people say that these are just theories and believe that they have not been proven by science. They talk and think about them as somehow inferior ideas about how the world works because they are called theories rather than, say, facts or laws. But these people are mistaken. It's not entirely their fault. It's because the word theory doesn't mean quite the same thing in the world of science as it does when used in general conversation, where it can mean a guess or a hunch or something that isn't quite known for sure. When scientists call something a theory, they mean a set of ideas that does three things. One, a scientific theory puts forward a comprehensive explanation for things we observe in nature. Two, a scientific theory provides strong evidence for that explanation. And three, perhaps most importantly, a scientific theory provides ways to make predictions about the aspects of the world it explains, which we can then test by further observation. In everyday conversation, we can dismiss someone's idea about something by saying, it's just a theory. But we can't dismiss the theories of Darwin and Einstein and other great scientists in the same way. In science, an idea about how the world works usually only gets accepted as a theory once it's been tested and shown to be supported by observations and other evidence. Things that are distinctly lacking from theories about Elvis's continued existence, alien visits to the Earth and shape-shifting reptiles running the world. The authority science can claim comes from evidence and experiment and an attitude of mind that seeks to test its theories to destruction. We measure scientific progress in our ability to reduce the uncertainties. And by that measure, we're making extraordinary progress. But there may be a problem in the way those uncertainties are communicated to the public. Scientists may not be willing enough to publicly discuss the uncertainties in their science, or to fully engage with those that disagree with them. And this has helped polarize the debate. Searches on the internet 
do not differentiate between thoroughly researched evidence and unsourced, uncorroborated assertion. Conspiracy theories compete on level terms with peer-reviewed science. In this new world of information overload, we look to people we trust to find those answers. And these days, it's not necessarily the scientists. Things are a little different when you have a denialist or an extreme skeptic. They're convinced that they know what's going on, and they only look for data that supports that position, and they're not really engaging in the scientific process. I think some extreme skeptics decide what to think first, and then cherry-pick the data to support their case. We scientists have to acknowledge we now operate in a world where point of view, not peer review, holds sway. I think part of the problem may be past controversies, where mainstream science has failed to win over the public. November 1963, an assassination. Not the assassination of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, but that of his assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald. It was this killing that permanently sealed JFK's murder in mystery. The conclusion of the official government investigation was simple yet unsatisfying. A disaffected loner with a cheap rifle killed the president by himself. Counter narratives started to appear. Amateur sleuths tried to follow the trajectories of the bullets backwards into the shadows. Their methods were a combination of lawyer, detective, and outsider. This style of reasoning became known as the conspiracy theory. Trust in government plummeted during the years of scandal and upheaval that followed. Finally, the president himself was implicated in a spying scandal and the fears of conspiracy thinkers seemed confirmed. Conspiracies were real. But the research into the Kennedy assassination was failing to develop a convincing alternative scenario. Instead, it had splintered into countless conflicting variations. And on the outskirts of popular culture, new and more outrageous ideas were developing. The flaws of the conspiracy theory were becoming obvious and its logic could lead to preposterous conclusions. According to the stories, the US government is concealing under top security flying saucers from another world and alien bodies cryogenically suspended in huge freezers. The term conspiracy was soon an insult. Why the fuck does everything have to be a conspiracy, huh? And yet, the conspiracy theory would continue to grow. Its influence absorbed into popular culture. It blurred into the realm of science fiction as claims of alien abductions and cover-ups multiply. This happened. If you believe it, that's all right. If you don't believe it, I don't care. The TV series The X-Files channeled all these themes of paranoia and beamed them into American living rooms every Sunday evening. While Oliver Stone's film JFK brought the Kennedy conspiracy theory back into the mainstream. Now we're through the looking glass here, people. White is black, and black is white. But it was a new form of media, the World Wide Web, that brought the conspiracy theory to its widest audience ever. And after the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, the conspiracy theory became an online sensation, and it's maintained a conspicuous presence in online culture ever since. By 2013, we'd entered a new era of suspicion and paranoia. Trust in government hovered at levels even lower than the Nixon era. Despite their persistently poor reputation, belief in conspiracy theories flourished. The conspiracy theory is something more than just paranoia from the fringes of society. It's a dramatic expression of a uniquely modern anxiety. The sensation that you are trapped within the invisible design of a greater power. What do you know you can't explain? But it's there, like a splinter in your mind. In the United States in particular, these fears have deep roots. Roots that tangle down into the core of the American identity and beyond. 
back through the centuries, past America's formation, and right down to the bedrock psychology of the conspiracy theory, the projection of human intentions upon complex events. The ancient Greeks once saw lightning bolts and imagined the fury of Zeus. But we later developed better understanding of the forces of nature, and we are now beginning to understand the complexity behind our own society. We are confronting powers more daunting than a shadowy elite, powers that we struggle to comprehend with the minds we've evolved. You don't get it. Then help me, please, I need to know. This may be hard for you to understand, but there is no conspiracy. Nobody is in charge. What we are now realizing is that we are guided, constrained, and even controlled by the systems we have made, by the rules, institutions, and technologies we ourselves created. And these systems have no ideology, they have no ambition, they are not greedy, they are not good, and they are not evil. They are simply not like us. Scientists had forgotten that we don't operate in an isolated bubble. We cannot take the public for granted. We have to talk to them. We have to communicate the issues. We have to earn their trust if science really is going to benefit society. We use the scientific method to understand how the natural world works. We generate hypotheses. We observe, we measure, we analyze, we replicate. Yet, when it comes to communicating the meaning and significance of our discoveries, why do we so often use our intuition instead of science? The stakes are too high to rely on our hunches. Just think of all the critical topics in science that suffer from ineffective communication. It doesn't have to be this way. Social, behavioral, and decision scientists have made great progress in understanding how communication fails and succeeds. We should be as scientific about communication as about the science we are communicating. Earning trust requires more than just focusing on the science. We have to communicate it effectively too. In a new world of social media, comic strips, nerd nights, and dancing your thesis, how is the way we communicate science changing? There has been a great explosion, um, a big bang of sorts, of, 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 of creative science communication. We have a landscape where there's so much media, so much mass media, that it is hard to compete. But it also means there's room for everything. People can start blogs, they can start podcasts, they can do YouTube videos, and they don't have to ask anyone's permission. If you really want your science to have impact to society, that is a whole different ballgame. Many of us are not trained to take advantage of all those opportunities to realize science impact in a whole new way from when I was trained as a grad student. And just as the channels for science communication are changing, so are the people telling the stories. There are a lot more people involved in telling these stories than there were before. There are lots of graduate students in biology or physics who just really want to make this part of what they do as scientists. There is a growing awareness that communicating that science from the scientists to the general public is important and valid and not a waste of time. The hardest part about science communication is that I rely and other scientists rely so heavily on technical terms. So with my work, because many of us have had personal experiences with getting sick and infectious diseases, I play upon that experience to try to put my audience in the shoes of a virus, thinking about what it does and how it behaves and where it came from. As these new ways of communicating make science personal, exciting, and accessible, they also ignite interests and engage new audiences. Science is not uh, some sort of um, privilege of the few. I mean, science is, it should be uh, available to everybody, and, and I think that everybody should be able to kind of enjoy the, the pleasures of, of learning about the world through science. How can science be boring? Science encompasses everything. Is the sun boring? It's a million times bigger than the Earth. It squeezes hydrogen atoms into helium atoms, and the little bit of leftover energy powers almost everything on Earth. 
We all want to make a difference, whether it's a difference in our scientific community or even a difference on a worldwide scale. And you can't realize any of those differences unless you can communicate clearly. I don't think that science always has to solve all our problems. It's just a way that we can just understand the world. And I think any time that we regain that sort of understanding, that's a good thing. Telling people our results, telling people what we've done, communicating. Until scientists have done both jobs, the research and then the communication, we haven't really done our job as scientists. If you don't communicate the science, you might as well never have done it. Let's look at two amazing scientific breakthroughs that started out as amazing scientific communication failures. In the 1800s, there lived a scientist called Gregor Mendel. Now, Mendel wasn't much of a people person, but he was really into peas. In 1866, Mendel published his pea findings. Unfortunately, because Mendel didn't really understand the art of promotion, no one noticed that he'd actually unlocked the secret of genetic inheritance. It wasn't until the 1900s and long after Mendel's death that people rediscovered his work and crowned him the father of genetics. Ah, penicillin. Such an awesome revolution of the 1940s. And it would have been even more of an awesome revolution if it had happened in the 1920s, which is when Fleming actually discovered the miracle drug. If that had happened, it would have come in totally handy for World War II, where millions of people died from bacterial infections. Bacterial infections that could have been cured by penicillin. The reason it took so long? What's the reason it took so long? The reason it took so long? After publishing his findings and getting a similar response to Mendel, Fleming chose to hang out in his lab rather than firing the cupcake cannons and going on a promotional tour with his amazing discovery. It wasn't until a decade later when biochemists Flory and Chain stumbled upon his research and thought, hmm, antibiotics, those could be cool, let's try them out in people. Okay, so science communication was harder back then. It's not like scientists could just dial up the internet to communicate on a global scale. Or a more recent example, six Italian scientists were convicted of manslaughter and put in prison just a few years ago for telling the town that there was no risk of an earthquake just a few days before a deadly earthquake actually hit. The cost of that mistake is hundreds of lives lost. The cost of Mendel not communicating his discovery is that evolutionary biology today is 40 years behind where it could have been. And the cost of Fleming not communicating his discovery was millions of lives lost due to bacterial infections that should have been treatable during World War II. It's not too much of a stretch to say that the entire fate of humanity could rest on scientists successfully communicating and collaborating to help solve the problems that are facing mankind today. But if this thought just leaves you depressed, think about some examples of science communication wins. Albert Einstein, who discovered the world's most famous equation and who campaigned relentlessly to educate the public about atomic weapons. Richard Dawkins, who developed the gene-centered view of evolution and coined the term meme. Zoologist Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter, who discovered a new species of turtle and raised awareness of the importance of environmental conservation. And Dolly, the world's most famous sheep, named after Dolly Parton's memory glands, went on to become 1997's Science Breakthrough of the Year. Dawkins, Einstein, Irwin, and the team behind Dolly the Sheep were all very conscious of the need to bring the public along with them. They all engaged, which meant they were able to educate, which meant they were able to gain support.